in a world where jobs are how most people make money. One man, one desire, one challenge dares to break the mold. Welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network, where we don't work for money. Money works for us. Coming soon. Viewer discretion advised. Welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network, where cash flow is king. Real estate investing, the means, so you can enjoy your retirement dreams. This is the show where we cut right to the chase. No sales pitch, no long monologues, just simple how-to real estate investing advice, so you can earn the passive income you need to enjoy your retirement today. And now, your host and chief old dog, Bill Manasero. Welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network. I'm your host, Bill Manasero, and this is a show where 50 plusers and anyone else who wants to join us get solid, no sales pitch, real estate investing advice to help generate real cash flow. This podcast airs twice weekly on Mondays and Fridays. And if you aren't already a subscriber, go to iTunes or Apple Podcasts, type in Old Dogs, spelled D A W G S find our podcast and subscribe. We have a great guest for you today. I'm excited about this. And our guest is Jason Yarusi. And uh, Jason is the founder of Yarusi Holdings with his wife, Peely. They have acquired $180 million in real estate across 1,500 multifamily units since 2017. He is an avid ultra runner and workout enthusiast. Jason also hosts the Multifamily Live podcast and the Jason and Peely uh, Yarusi um, YouTube channel. He wakes up daily at 4.32 a.m. Hey, that's a, uh, that's a, uh, I'll join you. I actually wake up about the same time every, like clockwork. Ah, it's crazy. Go. Maybe it's like. 431 or something. But anyway, <laughs> okay. Uh, he's also an aspiring ukulele player. All right. And uh, beyond real estate, Jason spends his time with his wife, Peely, and their three kiddos, Luke, Lily, and Leo. And he now moved from New Jersey to Tennessee. So uh, he's a neighbor here. So Jason, welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network. Thanks, Bill. I'm excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, it's great having you on. Uh, you're a, a young guy here. We, we occasionally have some you know, young pups come on the old dog show. And, you know, we uh, old dogs, we, we always love to learn new tricks. So uh, I'm excited to have you on. And uh, you got a great story to tell. But uh, I thought, yeah, maybe you could just kind of take us back a little bit and, uh, you know, give us your background. Sure, yeah, and I really appreciate you having me on the show here. Oh, it's, it's our pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on. Where did you originally come from, and uh, and how did you end up in real estate? Sure. So a very um, non-traditional path forward, as I'm, I'm sure a lot of listeners find their way into real estate, is that uh, I'm born and raised in New Jersey. I uh, lived there for most of my life before moving into New York City in my early 20s for a little bit, about 12 or 13 years. Um, I was in New York City. That's uh, where I met my wife, Peely, uh, although it took her about 10 years to finally look my way after meeting her, but <laughs> from the outset. We met working in bars and restaurants, and uh, that's where we had our first introduction. And uh, from that point, um, we ended up opening up um, some restaurants in New York City, opened up some bars, opened and sold a uh, brewery in New York City. And we're doing a lot of things um, actively in that space when uh, Hurricane Sandy happened. And Hurricane Sandy happened, you know, decimated the East Coast, a couple hundred thousand homes affected. And uh, my father in New Jersey um, has done construction all his life. I and mean, we come from four generations of a construction family. And he did a specific thing, still does, um, just about to retire, um, where he lives and moves houses. And he would do, you know, 10 to 12 projects a year, uh, you know, a lot of these for all different reasons. But uh, one is that for flooding reasons. And so Hurricane Sandy happens. And lo and behold, you know, the couple calls he would get a week goes to a thousand calls a day. And at that wow. time, 
my brothers working for me in the city, my wife Peely and myself, and we decided we uh, you know had a couple partners. We ended up um, you know selling and, and moving out to New Jersey to help Dad with the family business, and that was you know 2011, 2012, um, all the way up until about 2016 or 17, and we went from him doing about 300 to 325 elevation projects a year, and it was great. You know, it's 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 great to to help Dad. It was really a fun to help him with his vision forward. But the one thing that was always in front of us is that everything we were doing from the restaurants to the construction world were all service businesses where we had to continually be active to be able to have anything come back to us. And the the construction business is so specialized. It's, it's hard to, the, the risk allocation is so great. It's hard to really educate crews to be able to, you know, offset a lot of this workload. So basically like any service job, if you're not working, you're not making money. So coming in where Peely and I are starting to uh, grow a family, she, she had, um, was pregnant with our first kiddo, we just kept saying, we have to find a way to be able to get back some of our time because, you know, at that moment, we, you know, if there was 25 hours in a day, eight days a week, we, we would have used them up. And that's just the nature of a lot of life. And we kept asking that question. And one thing that kept popping up was the word real estate. And, you know, at that time, shoot, you know, we, we had no idea what that meant, but we did what we thought was logical at the time. Here, Pilly is pregnant. She went out there and got her real estate license, and we started um, going out there and flipping and wholesaling some homes, right? So lo and behold, we're very busy in the one construction business, and we just happened to start doing real estate projects that really just took away the time, limited time that we had. So we did that and we were doing fine with that, but we kept asking this question saying, you know, something's missing here because all we're doing is just compiling activity upon activity. And it came for Peely to meet a, uh, a friend at a, a, a meetup who was investing out of state into single family rentals. And we saw that and we said, you know, that, that's really interesting. And we went after that. We started doing the same thing, but instead of investing in single families, we started investing in two families, three families, and four families. And we were buying these completely distressed homes and getting contractors and getting property managers to basically carry the workload. And that was that first time where we saw the power of getting back to really what helped us in the restaurant business by using form a goal and accomplish a common goal. And that really was that first light bulb moment where we said, wow, because checks start showing up in the mail without us actively using our hands to do the work. And that was the start to us to say, I think we're onto something, but it's not quite right there because the the thought of having, you know, 20, 30, 50 duplexes all around, you know, the country just seemed overwhelming. So we kept asking that question, what else is out there? And we came upon large apartment investing. And that was that aha moment where he said, well, that's it. Because it got back to what we look for in a restaurant is that, you know, these buildings, uh, you could treat them like businesses and you could see how they're not being optimized, whether it's on the property side or the management side, usually both, and go and do the best business plan for that property to be able to accomplish that goal. So we sold off those smaller properties, dove all into learning about large multifamily back in the 2016 area and brought our first uh, 94 unit. And that was in May of 2017. And that was in Louisville, Kentucky. Wow. Wow. That, that's a little ways from, from New Jersey there. Um, you know, what sort of brought you to that area? Are we just looking across the nation at, at various investments? You know, we, we had the advice early on, and, and one of the things that I would recommend is that, you know, listen to others because everything's been tried, right? We, we, we always want to come up with a magical idea that's going to be this unicorn of an approach, but all of the facet rules, they, they've been tried and true, and we've seen people do this successfully. So someone said, find a market dive in very deep into that market. So we started looking at markets that had, you know, good population growth, you know, not, nothing out, outlandish, but, you know, two, three, four percent population growth per year, job growth, uh, job diversity, a number of different employers there, um, a lot of uh, workforce housing, a need um, for supply or and really a strong demand. So low vacancies in the area, um, a landlord friendly state. And so we were going through a couple different markets and we were um, led into Louisville, Kentucky. And um, my sister was one 
one of the, the few uh, of the family who didn't live in New Jersey, and she happened to live in Louisville. But uh, so that gave us an inkling because we had visited before, but we dove in to get very specific about that market. And New Jersey, although um, has a lot of pluses, it also has a lot of minuses. So we didn't feel that that was going to be the right market for us. You know, the price per pound for, for the cost compared to the rent levels there was just high. Um, a lot of the buildings were older, so mechanicals, um, you know, older. The taxes and insurance are completely, are typically elevated. It's a more of a landlord-friendly state. So we started looking for markets that fit the need, and Louisville w- was one of those markets. And so we went full force into Louisville, got very specific what we were looking for. We were looking for a 75 to 100 unit asset, BC asset built between 1970 and 2000. And we were only looking in the South and South Central submarkets because that's where the, the, the larger uh, filtration of, of workforce housing was. So we were able to build out a team of, uh, you know, of brokers, property managers, even lenders, and just start making connections with a very uh, through line approach of what we were going to look for and find. Interesting. And um, is that is that still the uh, the same profile of properties you look you look for today? It's in range. Uh, we, we've expanded to a few other markets. Uh, we pr- pretty much we have we bought five assets in Louisville, four of which we've sold. We've started to move into other markets, uh, Nashville being one of them, uh, Atlanta being one of them. Uh, we've been into a few other ancillary markets from there, but we still don't have a shotgun approach. We're still very dialed in and detailed into what we go after today. But yeah, that 75 to 100 unit um, range is, is a good range for us. We'd like that. We'd like to find, um, we have a good business plan for that. And that also affords us where we can have a full-time staff that can be afforded by the property on these properties. And are these, uh, you know, C-level, B-class properties? Most are garden style B to C properties. That's been a, a good run for us. Uh, we're trying to constantly find it where we're not um, we're not in the A range, but we're not into areas that are that are very crime ridden that we're going to be pulled down by the surrounding market. Right now, are you looking? You know, primarily. I mean, it sounds like it's a, a typical value add play for the most part. That is correct. I, for us, it's about optimizing the properties. You know, many times you'll come into these assets, and uh, you know, we we recently purchased one in Nashville, and uh, the building was built in 1972. You know, they had updated the roof, said you know, kept up on some of the exterior approach, but simple put, the the amenities were outdated. The uh, the units um, were still kept in classic condition, and it was surrounded by new construction. Right, so there, there's a great spot for us to come in there and really provide great housing at an affordable option compared to the new construction that was surrounding our property. Right. Uh, that's great. Uh, uh, what, what's your typical hold? I, I know, you know, back in 2016, it, uh, you know, you, you were, you know, a lot of us were turning around things in, in uh, you know, even two years uh, time, uh, some even one year um, because right. uh, prices are going up so much. Uh, what's sort of your typical hold uh, today? Sure. So we, we underwrite to five years with a typical business plan being five to seven years. But of the 21, 22 transactions um, we've done, we've gone full cycle coming up. It will be 11. We have one coming up to close, so 10 right now. But they've all been somewhere between that two and three and a half year range where we've sold these properties, except for one for which we did sell in a year. Right. Right. Wow. Well, it uh, it sounds it sounds like you're you're really kicking butt there. Just uh, you know, uh, fifteen hundred multifamily units uh, since twenty seventeen. That's uh, nothing to scoff at. And uh, how do you see the market today? I, I know with the recession, interest rates, um, uh, you know, inflation, so many different factors uh, that are impacting the the economy and the marketplace. Um, uh, are, are there less uh, available properties out there you finding or, um, you know, is it difficult to finance? You know, what what are some of the, the challenges? It's a mix of all. I, I think if we could 
place a relationship with it is that, you know, we're always looking at present time. But right now, you know, if you go back even to, to COVID, right, there, there was so much uncertainty. And when the uncertainty continues to to adapt, right, we continue to move is that um, banks can't get used to this, right? So once things started to become, I'll call it commonplace during COVID, but more a, a, a associated is that banks started to level out and start lending again. Right now, because of the fluidity in the market, you're seeing, again, a lot of banks stand on the sidelines or just really put out term sheets that they probably won't um, be able to take forward or just really offering debt that's not going to work. And on the same side, sellers um, are still seeing, you know, six, nine, they were at this price point, so they're not willing to go out there and sell it at such a discount, right? Because on the other side of it, rents are still going up because we're seeing still a, a very large lack of supply of housing, you know, that the need for another 5 million units that we're not going to meet uh, just this decade. So renters are, are trying to find a home but can't afford it and over the last year the amount of home they could get uh just a year ago with it with the same debt payment is is at the same point about 30 percent less today so there's none of those homes out there so they're going to be pushed to rent longer which puts more pressure on rental demand which continues to push up and elevate rent prices so for those sellers they're saying well listen you know we're, are those uh we're still getting you know great rent bobs occupancy's great we're having our, our rents are just well ahead of our performance and we want these price points but you can't go out there and match it with a debt that's going to make sense for upcoming buyers, at least right now. And are you doing just sort of traditional type of uh, funding, like uh, Fannie Freddie, uh, you know, uh, uh, or are you guys, you know, having to find yourself to be a little more creative or short term? We have a couple based on the business plan. Uh, so two from last year. The one thing that I find I have to be careful with is that if my exit plan is is potentially shorter, say two, three, or four years, depending on the Fannie or Freddie product, um, you could be limited trying to sell at that time because of the prepayment penalty. So we've been trying to continue forward to make great banking relationships here. So we have a lot of options to work with banks that can give us good debt terms, but also are not um, very uh, prohibitive on future sales. And so the one we just I was talking about before in Nashville. We have a, you know, we purchased that about three months ago. We got a five-year fixed rate uh, for which um, after year one, there's no prepayment penalty to, to pay it off. And that, that puts us in a good approach here that we can be, we can make good choices, whether the debt market improves, we want to refinance or we get, you know, ahead of our business plan and want to sell, um, or we, we want to, you know, sustain for a while and just hold on to it at the current term. We can do all of those with the current business plan. And that's usually the, the kind of debt options that we want to look for is that where we can get good fixed rate debt, we can have reserves and have cash flow on the property and puts us in a, a really phenomenal place to make the best decisions for the property. Sure. And, and how do you find the, the, the investor community right now? I mean, are they a little bit, uh, you know, reluctant uh, because of the economy or do you find uh, no, no change or where is that at? You know, like anything, um, there's a little bit of everything. Right. There are investors who are, are completely wary of, of just some of what's happening today or what potentially could come. There's some that are still very active out there um, looking to invest into these assets or some that may be seeking to still capture on bonus depreciation 100 percent. That's going to start to fizzle down you know, next year and next. So they're, they're on all sides of it. Um, what I will say is that you know, we just have to continue to put forward with a sound of multiple options, because if you think about you know, where I was when I started with where, where the market was compared to, you know, even a year later to two years later when we're into COVID to, you know, a year later to where we have all this accelerated growth to where we stand today, the market is going to continue to be dynamic, right? And so making short-term choices is what's going to really expose us. And so if we can continue to look at this to have a great business plan with a great team around us, it's going to put us in the best position to be able to adapt to anything that comes up. That's great. And so you find that there are plenty of options out there in terms of uh, uh, properties that meet uh, your standards? No, it's it's always a competitive environment. And, and you know, we're, if to say that our goal is to typically find one asset per quarter. Now, 
I'll say we're, we're, we're aggressively patient. You know, we're not going to just buy to buy, but that, that's our goal. And we look to put out the, the, the efforts to, to just continue to bring um, deals into our ecosystem based on that narrative. However, you may find that in, in some timelines, um, you, you may do maybe one deal in one quarter and then not do a deal for a couple quarters. And then in the last quarter, maybe you do two deals and that's fine with us, right? And so we, we continue to try to really stick to our box and those deals will come to us in a timely fashion for which we continue to put out there our efforts to find them. And is it a little bit tighter in terms of returns uh, for investors, uh, you know, uh, in terms of maybe your preferred returns? Yeah, right now, that's the hardest thing is, is the debt. And we want to be careful to make sure that if we are going to bring on a project, just like I said, is that we're not limited on, on our exit. Because if we did, say we put on a Fannie or Freddie product, product now that has yield maintenance and maybe the rates at, you know, six and a half. And, you know, well, if rates uh, react in a way that they start to decrease in, in the near future, we're going to be stuck into that Fannie product without much options. And it's going to really hinder us on our business plan forward. So we've been picky and what kind of projects we've been going after here because we don't want to just take on a project where we're just saying, okay, we need to really check the box, take a project on. So that's been some of our limitations right now as to looking at projects and making sure they stay completely into our box. And if not, then we'll let things settle out where in the next 12 to 18 months, uh, there's going to be some changes out there that, that are going to give us some attractive options we want to be ready for. Great, great. Well, you've uh, been doing this for a relatively short period of time here, you know, five, six years here, and um, and yet you've grown, you know, a substantial uh, portfolio and sounds like a number of transactions. Um, what mistakes did you make sort of early on that uh, you've learned from today that uh, have, uh, you know, it's been a kind of lesson that you appreciate learning, you know, where uh, it may be hard, but uh, at the same time, it's something that... Uh, you're glad you found out so that uh, sure. as you move forward. Yeah. So the, the first one in 94 unit, uh, you know, my wife and myself basically did everything right. You know, we, from everything from, you know, creating the relationships, finding a deal, you know, um, meeting investors to, um, you know, um, getting the loan on there, signing on the docs, raising the capital, finding the property manager, doing the asset management. And, you know, why that all sounds well and good, you, you are your own limitation. And that carried through for the first couple of deals where we continue to just run everything. And it, it creates a uh, it creates a stopgap where we're the piece of the puzzle that's really holding up the future success of the business, right? Because if we're, you know, talking to one property manager, then we're not working on another project. If we're, you know, talking to investors, we're not, uh, you know, confirming our due diligence, right? And so once we understood that we were really, the, the one piece was us holding back our growth. It allowed us to work and to bring on team members that could make sure that all the pieces of the puzzle are being met efficiently and effectively, which makes for each project to continue to grow at the pace it should. Right. Uh, you you uh, mentioned this 100-mile uh, mindset. What, what exactly are you referring to there? You know, it becomes a lot with today with with social media that we get caught into just seeing someone else's success as if it was just real time right like oh today they did this and now they're this right and that's a lot of what you know our wishful thinking is and our our, our minds are is that oh i tomorrow i want to have this or you know i tried this and all of a sudden i didn't get the result i want so i might as well just throw in the towel and what i found um you know running a lot of races here is that you know as you start to run longer and longer races you just don't know what the outcome is going to be because you haven't ever experienced um, the event and so I, i'd run you know countless marathons but going to run 100 miles you know when you train for a marathon you, you may run a couple 20 mile races pre um pre-marathon however with a 100 mile um race you know my first one i wasn't it wasn't like i was going to go out there and was a couple times before the race and so i said well i just don't know know how to really you know react to this because i've never felt this so why don't i just run six miles every day and i'll just do it every day whether you know it's 100 degrees whether it's 20 degrees whether it's my kids are sick every single day i'm just going to run the six miles just show up and do it 
And what I found is that when I got into the race, if I was to think about the race as, you know, I have to run 100 miles today, it would be daunting because I hadn't experienced before. Just like someone who says, I want to go buy my first apartment building, or I want to go climb Mount Kilimanjaro, or I want to, you know, meet the love of my life, or I want to, you know, be a millionaire, right? Because we haven't experienced that, it kind of like the uh, the New Year's resolution, it fails because it's out of the gate because we scare ourselves away from the ledge. And what I discovered with running this race, you know, the first of a couple of them is that if I could just set mile markers of, of many tasks or many wins, it allowed me to get to the next part to say, okay, can I just run five miles to the first aid station, right? So I run five miles, get to the, the drink station and say, okay, well, let me just get to the next one. I'll just run another five miles, get to the next one. Well, let me run another 10 miles. I'll get to the bridge. And I'll just figure it out, you know, and every time I was like, maybe I have hesitation on point, but let me just run another seven miles and just get to, to the gate. Let me just run another 20 miles and get to this point. Let me just run another five miles and get to the next aid station. It, may, it might be, let me just get another 200 steps and another 300 steps. And then you end up getting to 100 miles, which was basically one mile at a time. And if we can look at our goals and look at our attitude in that fashion, it allows us to set the stage where we can continue to create actionable events that we can accomplish, right? So it could be anything from, you know, want to buy an apartment building? Well, maybe I need to pick up a, a, a book and read it on apartment investing. Or maybe I need to decide on a market that could potentially be a good market for me to look at. Or maybe I need to get on the phone with someone who's actively doing this or listen to a podcast like this one here, right? And you can create goals that don't set you apart from the big goal that typically scares most people from starting. So you think that would be... Uh... Uh, something that has really affected just this, you know, success story that you have right now um, is, is having that same mindset. I'm a bit stubborn in nature coming from a family of Italians, right? So <laughs> on that point, it's, it's typically to the point is that we are our own limitations on most of any, anything. And it, we can say that, you know, someone else is stopping us or someone said this or something else has happened to us, but it's us in our mind each and every day that usually prevent us from taking action or getting to where we want to get. And if we can just show up with one thing to accomplish each day, people will say, well, I want, you know, I'm, if I just got to find six or seven hours today to spend on learning of investments. Well, by the time you spend three months trying to get that six and seven hours, if you just spent 10 minutes a day just doing one activity toward your goal, how much further along would you be? And most of the energy is just being diligent to yourself, like even getting up early, right, is that that's the first part of your day for which you can either say, yeah, I'm going to sleep in our 10 minutes or, uh, you know, yeah, not stick to your plan. And the more you can be responsible to yourself, the quicker and easier it will be for you to continue to push forward to get to your goals. Mm, that's great. Great. I love it. Yeah, I've always been an early riser ever since I, you know, became an entrepreneur. It was just something that just fell in. And uh, uh, th those are my best hours as the early yeah. hours. <laughs> you know, it's just uh, I get the, the best stuff done in, in that time. And uh, uh, it's really, really valuable. That's great. In our audience are folks that are 50 years of age and older. They're already in retirement or they're approaching retirement. And they're really looking at real estate investing as a means for them to uh, you know, to be able to either generate more cash flow uh, in in their retirement, uh, maybe they're looking at their nest egg, thinking, "Gee, you know, is this going to make it you know, make it all the way through for me?" Um, do, what would you say to those folks uh, in terms of uh, real estate and uh, investing in real estate as a means to to help them out in their retirement? You know, real estate has continued to be one of the best paths forward for a lot of people, but what really separates uh, those who benefited from it and those that don't is having clear goals of what you're looking to accomplish with real estate, right? So, so if you're someone here who wants to go out and actively be involved in real estate, well, then, then that's one conversation, you know, that from that, everything of find your own properties, you know, putting together the plan, the financing and all the pieces, and that, that can be great. However, if you're looking for something more passive and something that's going to allow you more flexibility to continue doing what you're in your life, well, real estate investing can be a great path because, you know, multifamily investing can offer everything from, you know, cash flow, appreciation, depreciation, tax advantages, debt pay down, all these different ways that, that people can benefit from real estate. However, one of the, the main things to, to ask is that 
do I need cash flow today? Is that important? Because that may be one type of investment. Or am I more aligned and I'm looking to just grow my net worth for the future and I'm, I'm, I'm bigger to take on um, more riskier that have a return in the future but don't have the cash flow? It, are, are depreciation benefits important to me? So I may invest out of my personal accounts instead of my retirement accounts, right? So a number of these questions come back to you asking yourself, what is your goal here? Besides just to invest in real estate, what are you trying to accomplish with investing in real estate? Because it can provide so much value to you, your life, and, and to your, your future earnings uh, as long as you have a clear path of what you're trying to do. And that's gonna help you if you are trying to invest passively. Uh, hopefully align with the right partners to invest with because they can learn what you're trying to invest with to see if it is a good fit for both of you. That's great. Great advice. Well, uh, you, you have this, this incredible business that, uh, you know, maybe started off as just, uh, you know, investing in a couple of <laughs> properties and, and has really grown quite a bit. What, what's sort of your, your long-term goal here and, and what excites you about the future of your company? It's been great to really have such a great relationship with a lot of investors that has continued to flourish and to have the referrals that have come in and to be able to see these projects go full cycle and really help them meet some of their goals has been phenomenal. And for us, it's continuing to grow our purpose and our vision forward with the company to continue to expand to be other great uh, members of our team. You know, we've hired four people um, in the last year and that's been great. That's been a great growth for us because they've come on to again, you know, be put in their best path forward. So for us at University Holdings, we're gonna continue on our approach, do a deal quarter. That's been good to us. We're gonna continue to carry that towards forward and to be able to help more and more people meet, meet their financial goals through the investments we find. Mm, that's exciting. That's great. Well, we are kind of we're come running to the end of our, our interview here, and uh, we have a, a segment we call Wrap It Up. And in there, I ask you a series of quick questions of uh, resources that you've used that may be beneficial for our listeners. Uh, if you're ready, we can go ahead and uh, wrap it up. Sure. That'd be great. All right. Uh, first question, uh, favorite real estate book? You know, um, I was actually looking at this because I, I saw that question coming up and uh, my friend Joe Furthers wrote a great book, Best Ever Apartment Syndication Book. That's always a fun read because of a lot of the P core pieces that we use in our business each and every day. Yeah, that's a great book. Great book. How about just a favorite general business book? Uh, general business book, it's it's usually the last book I read. And uh, right now I'm reading uh, Marcus Aurelius's uh, Meditations. And that, that's just a good response because, you know, we always want to think that that nothing is the same. However, you know, uh, you know, thousands of years ago, we're still talking about the same thing that we're still talking about today. Right. Just just put in a different light. That's true. That's great. Uh, how about a, a website that you use on, on a regular basis that's been invaluable to you? Oh man, there's so many out there. Um, the uh, the Chatham Financial is a really good one right now for for any investors that are out there that are looking um, to just understand uh, really the different debt terms, the one month SOFR, you know, all all the moving financial pieces or even prepayment penalties. Chatham Financial is a great site. Great, great recommendation. Uh, how about a, a, an app on your phone that uh, you really um, utilize on a regular basis? Oh, but so the, the podcast app's great, right? I, I, I use that tremendously uh, and the right app. Uh, we run a lot of our projects out of Google Drive um, to really keep track, make sure everything's put in the right spot. So Google Drive's a great one. Excellent, excellent. Um, do you have a favorite quote? Success is uh, making irrational, reasonable choices. And uh, what, what that typically means is that most see that you know, they don't get to success because they stay with really the path forward that everybody else is doing who's not on the path to success themselves. But when you can make to yourself choices that are rational to which others seem unreasonable, you typically find yourself alone on the path where you want to be because others aren't willing to make that sacrifice to get there. Mm, great, that's great. Our final question, if you lost absolutely everything, including all of your assets, and uh, you had to start all over, knowing what you already know, and you only have $1,000 in cash, what would you do with that $1,000 to relaunch your real estate investing business? Uh, social media is a very powerful tool to be able to find your way into making great connections. 
So I would, if I was to start all over again, I would start a podcast again and get myself out there talking to as many people as possible. Because just like this conversation today, I've, I've had the uh, fortunate opportunity to speak to so many great people that I've been connected to through podcasts, right? And those relationships have car- continued to carry forward and be so beneficial um, still to this day. And it will continue to carry forward into the future as well. Yeah, I, I agree with you. That's uh, that's a total winner uh, here too. I, and after seven years here, um, it's been incredible for uh, my real estate investing. Well, gosh, I'm sure there's a lot of folks listening here that are um, you know just real interested in what you've had to say. Um, what's the best way for folks to to reach you and uh, get in contact with you? Sure. And thank you so much for having me. Uh, you can learn more about my company and myself over at yarusiholdings.com. That's Y-A-R-U-S-I holdings.com. Or reach out to me directly at jason at yarusiholdings.com. Awesome. Uh, great. Well, uh, it has been just awesome having you on. Now, we have a tradition here, though, with the old dogs, uh, REI Network. And yeah, all of our guests closes out with their best old hound dog howl. So, you know, you're in Tennessee now. So, you know, there's a lot of hound dogs here. So, you know, they have no excuse not to be able to do this, Jason. You realize that? <laughs> I got to say, I gotta say, well, I, I don't know if uh, it caught on the audio, but I got my bulldog outside the door trying to trying to scratch through the door. Yeah, I, got, of, I got the same thing here. I got a dog. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Picking right. up. She, she, I love yeah. it protector of, of when nothing needs to be protected only out there so she, she gets it for sure right there so i love it <laughs> well maybe you can get him going if uh if you, you know, give us a good howl here yeah well i'll go whoa, whoa, whoa. all right <laughs> that'll work <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jason. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Uh, a lot of, lot of good good information there and some uh, great advice as well. So uh, uh, I just really want to thank you for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. I also want to thank all our old dog listeners out there for joining us. I know there's a lot of other things you could be doing right now, but the fact that you've taken the time to join us means a lot, and we really appreciate it. Now, please note, everything that Jason talked about today is uh, going to be outlined in detail in our show notes on the Old Dogs website at olddogsreinetwork.com forward slash blog. And uh, just look for the episode with uh, Jason Yarusi. Well, that's the show for today. Remember, cash flow is king and real estate investing the means. Until next time, keep moving forward and may God bless. Thank you very much for visiting the Old Dogs REI Network. We would greatly appreciate if you would stop by iTunes and let us know what you think of the show. We would love if you could subscribe to the podcast, give us a five-star rating, and write a review. The more ratings and reviews we receive, the more visible the podcast will be to others. Thank you.